Hi, so um, in previous lectures, uh, we covered in general the principles of lenses and um, how you form an image and uh, how lenses are used in microscopy or in microscope instruments. I'm going to go into a little more detail today um, as to what really is specifically um, different about an objective lens. I'm going to cover some of the types of objective lenses and uh, some of the properties that are, are important. Um, mostly I'm going to go through aberrations, optical aberrations. And I'll talk in general about optical aberrations, but um, I'll really concentrate more on the optical aberrations that can become serious issues in the uh, use of a research microscope. I'm going to specifically talk about aberrations that you can induce that cannot be corrected in the design of lenses. So let's just jump into it. I'm going to talk in general about uh, classes of objective lenses. And I have three lenses here. And what you can notice right away is that there's a very, uh, very uh, significant difference in the number of lenses. So when we talked about lenses earlier in the lectures, we, we talked about an ideal simple lens. And a lot of that is to allow us to sort of grasp the principles at work. Um, an objective lens is actually the most complex optics in, in, the, uh, in the system. And they actually are very complicated lens groups within an objective, uh, having anywhere from four or five lenses in the simple achromat all the way on the far side there to up to 17 lenses in a very highly corrected plan apochromat lens. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs that have to be made. Um, mostly what you're doing with a lens, of course they do magnify your image um, in, in general, but uh, what you're really doing is making aberration corrections. Um, you're concentrating on specific transmissions, which is often specific to the type of research you're doing, as well as your resolving power. And resolving power is one of the really key parts of a microscope objective lens. Okay. So these three classes that I showed you here, uh, we'll start with the achromat lenses. Those are the lowest uh, cost lenses and the least corrected lenses. And you can see up here on the top um, the specifications of an achromat lens, generally corrected for red and blue um, in around the 656 nanometer and 486 nanometer range. Um, and they correct for spherical aberration for one wavelength in the green. Fluorite lenses are more highly corrected. and um, they're corrected from two to four colors for both uh, axial chromatic aberration and spherical aberration, which we're going to talk a bit about uh, later. And then the most highly corrected lenses are the apochromats, which are corrected for four to five colors, generally from the violet out until the red. And those lenses are um, generally the, the more expensive lenses, but not necessarily the best for the work that you're trying to do. Uh, the more glass you put in a lens, the higher the corrections are, the more transmission you lose, the more light is absorbed by the glass. So it's always a trade-off of corrections versus transmission and so on, and numerical aperture. All of these types of lenses are available in what they call plan versions, which are um, flat field corrected. So that when you look in the eyepiece, you can see a nice flat corrected field of view. Uh, in the case of uh, most cameras and confocals, you're not using that outer part of the field of view. So again, it depends on what your needs are in the laboratory. Okay. So one property I want to talk about um, on a lens is actually the most expensive part of a lens and also is the um, uh, definition of a couple of things. First is the resolving power of the lens and that's numerical aperture. The highest resolving power um, is the highest numerical aperture, but it's also the highest light gathering capability. So a lens that's got a very high numerical aperture will also be very bright compared to a lens with a low numerical aperture. And you can see the uh, formula right here for numerical aperture. Na equals N, the refractive index of the immersion media, times the sine of theta. And the sine of theta is the broadness of that cone of illumination that you see there. And basically, that is the light gathering capability of the lens. It's also the cone of illumination that light can come out of the lens at, which becomes important for applications like total internal reflection fluorescence. OK. So numerical aperture, uh, I just wanted to show you here sort of the trade-off of working distance versus numerical aperture. And basically you can see these two cones of illumination. For a very high numerical aperture lens, such as this 100x lens here, 
um, you can see that it's got a, a very short working distance. It has to be very close to the specimen. Whereas for the 4X lens, which has a relatively low numerical aperture, yeah, you, you see that it's got um, a very far working distance. So there's again another trade-off you have to think about um, in, in the lenses. Generally, there is a trade-off between numerical aperture and working distance. Okay. So you notice that the uh, the uh, symbol N for uh, refractive index was was coded, and um, that's a very special. Uh, part of the equation, and I wanted to uh, discuss that in a little more detail. And this really relates to immersion media. So in, in an objective lens, you can see on the, um, on, on the uh, far left there, the, um, an air objective lens. And what you see is light coming up through the glass, and it's refracted or bent as it leaves the high refractive index glass going into air. And Unless you have uh, an extremely large lens, you end up losing light that is bent out of the collectible region of the objective lens. So when we use um, higher, higher, uh, NA, a higher refractive index immersion media, we can then bend, decrease the refraction out of the collectible area of the lens and get more light into the lens. So you see on the, uh, on the example on the right, there's um, an oil immersion lens where you have no refraction or very little refraction between the glass and oil interface, allowing the uh, lens itself to collect the maximum amount of light and the maximum uh, resolution. So uh, in, in the uh, formula for numerical aperture, when you're thinking about resolution, you, you should definitely think about um, immersion media. And you should be aware of two things. One is that the higher the numerical aperture, the higher resolution, and to get very high numerical apertures, you have to go to an immersion media lens. And also, that the numerical aperture of the lens, if you do some rearrangement of the equation, you can see that the numerical aperture can never exceed the refractive index of the immersion media. So uh, shown here on the bottom, you can see a typical oil immersion lens has a refractive index oil of 1.515. The maximum NA lenses that are available in oil immersion is about a 1.49. Um, that's about the highest uh, res resolving power lens you can get. And that uh, has the highest, uh, highest refractive index uh, media that uh, uh, they use for standard microscopy. In the case of a water immersion lens, water with a refractive index of 1.33 can have a maximum NA up to about 1.27. Um, so most commonly around 1.2, there are lenses available with 1.25 and 1.27 NA. Okay. So next we're going to move on and move into optical aberrations. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is, is considered an off-axis aberration. It's affected mostly by light that's not going straight through the optical uh, path, but light that's coming in off-axis. And that's called field curvature. Now, field curvature basically is due to the curved surfaces of lenses. And how you would see it in the microscope is that you can't get the entire field in focus at the same time. Maybe at one focal point, you'll have the center in focus. At another focal point, you'll have the periphery in focus. But you can't get them both in focus at the same time. Basically, it'll make the specimen appear to have the curvature of the lens surface. And we do correct that by adding additional lens groups in, in the objective lens. Um, it's impossible to completely correct for field curvature at the very outer edges. And that's why microscopes generally have a larger field than they can actually see through the eyepieces or through uh, any of the imaging devices. Um, so basically, you clip or cut the uh, outer curved field where the lenses get a very steep curvature at the edges. The next uh, off-axis aberration I'm going to talk about is astigmatism. And an astigmatism is uh, basically um, a point source of light that appears as a line and or an ellipse. And when you go through focus, it changes its directionality. It comes into focus and then changes directionality the other way. And that is an astigmatism. Um, this is uh, also due to uh, lens manufacturing. It's um, basically due to an asymmetry in the manufacture of lenses. It's something that in uh, general isn't really an issue in lenses unless they've been dropped or damaged. Most high quality lenses don't have any appreciable astigmatism. Okay. Uh, that's also similar for coma. 
Um, coma is uh, an uneven focus of light as it passes through the periphery versus the axis of the lens. It's similar to spherical aberration, which I'm going to talk about later, but it's really more of a property for off-axis illumination. And the light that's passing through the center, as you can see on the far right, goes to one zone far off uh, in the periphery, and then light through the uh, peripheral areas um, goes into different zones. It appears in the microscope as a streak or a comet almost, a point of light that has a tail that streaks out towards the periphery of the lens. Okay. So often due to misalignment in an optical system, so if the lens is in good shape, what you're going to want to do if you're seeing coma in the image is you're going to want to make sure that your microscope is completely um, aligned or, or uh, methodically aligned so that everything uh, uh, is on axis. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move into on-axis aberrations. And the one that I'm going to talk about first is um, spherical aberration um, here. And spherical aberration is actually one of the most serious aberrations that you, can, uh, you have to deal with in a microscope. And this is one that we do correct, as we talked about earlier, but we have to correct for under a very limited set of conditions that are not realistic for imaging. And uh, I'll get into some more detail and explain that. But this is one that's generally induced by the use of the microscope under the conditions that you need to, um, uh, to answer the questions you're interested in the lab. So what it is is uneven focus of monochromatic light due to the curvature of lenses. Okay? Um, the next one I'm going to talk about in some detail is axial chromatic aberration. So I'm going to go back and go into detail on both of these. Um, axial chromatic aberration is an on-axis um, aberration, and that's actually due to the dispersion of light. So light, when it passes through a media, each media has its own property of dispersion. And that is that each wavelength of light, when it hits that media, has a, a specific refractive index. So some light is bent more than others. In the case of a simple ideal lens, the blue light is bent more, and you can see that the blue light focuses closer to the lens than the red light, which focuses further out. And uh, this is a serious problem, but it's something that we can correct for um, within uh, reason in the microscope. However, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about aberrations that can be induced. So even if you have a very highly corrected lens, it's possible to go ahead and induce chromatic aberration by using the lens under improper conditions. Okay. So um, one thing that I think is important to understand for all um, discussions on aberrations is the point spread function. Because it's going to come back uh, several times throughout the course. And um, basically what the point spread function is, is the convolution of, the, uh, of a point source of light as it passes through the optical system. So if you have a point source of light, say that example on the far right, and you focus up and down and you build a 3D volume, and you look at this XZ projection here, you can see that the XZ projection looks like a small hourglass. That's actually the best case scenario. If the optical system is working perfectly and everything's aligned and you have great quality lenses, a point of light comes out as a small hourglass, ideally at the limit of resolution of that optical system. It devi defines the convolution of the optical system and is also a really good way to go ahead and evaluate any aberrations in the microscope system, generally shown as a 3D XZ projection, as you can see there. Okay. So going into a little more detail, axial chromatic aberration, as I mentioned before, is due to the dispersion of, of uh, light as it passes through a material. Uh, so what you can see here is that example of chromatic aberration. And then on the bottom, we have a lens group called an achromatic doublet. And in the case of an achromatic doublet, what they do is they have two different types of glass that are sandwiched together, usually a concave and a convex lens, that are sandwiched together. And both of those types of glass have different dispersion properties. And they're calculated to correct for different types of um, uh, different wavelengths of light so that they focus in the same place. So a simple achromatic doublet like you see here now is correcting so that red, green, and blue light are all focusing in the same place. Okay. Okay. But if you have this lens and it's very well corrected, 
um, you can easily cause or induce chromatic aberration. So what you see here is a figure um, looking at a three-color sub-resolution bead. And you can see that uh, on the far left, there's an immersion oil from Nikon, which matches the Nikon lens that this was imaged with. In the center is another um, immersion oil, uh, which is from API, uh, now GE Healthcare. And third is an immersion oil from Cargyle, which is a company that makes immersion media for optical imaging. Uh, in fact, they actually make all three of these oils. And what you can see here is that um, in the XY projection, there's no, uh, no shift or no aberration. But when you look axially in the XZ projection, now you can see that in the Nikon oil you have no shift, but in the center where you see the API oil, you have a negative 400 nanometer shift in the blue signal and a positive 200 nanometer shift in the red signal. In the case of the Cargyle oil, you have a positive 800 nanometer shift of the red signal and the blue and green are overlapping. Well, the reason that these are all different, this is all immersion oil that has a 1.515 refractive index, but they differ in their dispersion. So each manufacturer that makes lenses matches the oil to the dispersion of the glass that they use to manufacture those lenses. So if you're going to go and use a non an oil that doesn't come from the manufacturer. And there are reasons you'd want to do that, for example, to get oils that match your refractive index of water and things like that, or special oils for special fluorescence properties. You'd want to find out from the manufacturer what their dispersion number is. It's called an Abbe number, and that is the dispersion number of the glass that they've used to make that lens. If you then call up a company like Cargyle and ask them to formulate or send you oil that matches that dispersion property, you'll eliminate this induced chromatic aberration. Okay. So next, uh, going into more detail on spherical aberration. So in the case of spherical aberration, we saw some uh, examples earlier and we talked about what's called an ideal thin lens. And that's a lens where light passes through and you can see here a collimated beam of light passing through this lens and it focuses to a point called the focal point at 1F or focal length away from that lens. Okay? It's a nice neat little diagram and it allows you to understand in general terms how a lens works. Um, the problem is that in reality, there's no such thing as an ideal thin lens. Uh, like many of the things that we learn uh, when we're young, they are greatly oversimplified so that we can grasp the concepts. In reality, uh, lenses are actually made from spheres of glass or other optical materials. Generally, in the case of microscopes, it's glass. So what you're looking at here is actually the top lenses of a 100x plan apo lens. And they're small balls of glass that are polished. And you can see this polishing machine here. There's a pad up there that goes down and it polishes on top. There's a diamond slurry that runs through. Um, one of the things that I really noticed when I first saw this process was also why lenses to this day are so expensive. A very highly corrected high numerical aperture objective lens can cost as much as the microscope that you're putting it on. And the reason for that is because lenses today are, are still made primarily by hand. So these little top lenses actually polish for several weeks and you can see that the ones in the center of the plate versus the ones in the outer edge of the plate would rotate at a different uh, speed in the polisher. So somebody opens this up every 30 minutes and moves those balls to this position and vice versa. So basically I just wanted to show that lenses are made from balls of glass and there's no such thing as an ideal thin lens. Um, this is another lens. This is the second lens down in a Plan APO 60 uh, X magnification objective and you can see that they're polished in a different way. They sit on a, a stick with tar holding them and they polish around and around. But still, um, spherical surfaces or curved surfaces and volume. Okay. So now that you have that uh, situation where you have um, spherical surface and, and curve, you have light that actually is refracted or bent from that curvature. Okay? So how do you induce spherical aberration? Well, most commonly, so lenses are corrected for it, but most commonly it's done by the imaging conditions such as incorrect uh, cover slip thickness or mismatch of the refractive index of the immersion media. 
Um, and it's not as simple as it sounds. It's not a matter, uh, for example, with chromatic aberration of just buying the right oil. And I'll explain that in some, some more detail. So now you have this uh, nice simple figure and uh, no longer do you have that nice neat focal point, but you have light that's bent or refracted when it hits the air glass surface here on the lens and then it goes through the glass and it's bent or refracted again and you get some rays that focus close to the lens, some rays that focus further away and you end up with this tight waist in the middle which is termed the circle of least confusion and that actually is that tight waist of the point spread function that you're imaging um, and basically the the light that goes through the axis called the paraxial focus um, is going to focus further away from the lens. The light that comes from the uh, periphery here is going to focus closer to the lens. Okay. So you no longer have that nice little uh, point and you end up with this smear in the Z direction of your focal points. So how do you recognize spherical aberration? And this is also how you would correct a correction collar or adjust a correction collar. What you want to do is focus up and down in the microscope. So this shows you a focus through of a point source of light. And what happens is when you focus up and down, if you have no spherical aberration present, you get perfect symmetry above and below that point of focus. However, in the case of spherical aberration, you'll have a terrible asymmetry. You'll have maybe rings of light on one side and a diffuse haze on the other side. And uh, basically then, to correct a, adjust a correction collar, you would move that collar until you see the best symmetry of a, the smallest resolvable thing in the specimen. Ideally, beads are, are, are a great specimen to look at subdiffraction spots, but that's not always a luxury you have. So try and find something in your specimen that looks like it's at the limit of resolution, focus up and down, adjust that collar, and uh, stop when you get the best symmetry focusing up and down. Okay. So as I mentioned before, modern objective lenses are extremely complicated. And I'm going to explain to you basically why we can't correct for spherical aberration in the manufacture of the lens. Um, so, so here's a uh, cutaway of a plan APO 60X lens. And you can see that this lens actually has 17 lenses inside it. It's a very complicated optical system. And you see some of those achromatic doublets, uh, such as right here. And the achromatic doublet, you actually have to calculate the two different types of dispersion with the wavelengths to correct for a band of wavelengths. But then when we add another achromatic doublet to go ahead and correct for a large band of wavelengths, that changes all of the calculations that I made for the first achromatic doublet. So I guess the point I want to make is that when you have a very complex optical system here with 17 lenses in it, the math gets extremely, extremely complicated. And you have to have known parameters to be able to solve that math at all. Um, why are they so complicated? Well, they have to correct for chromatic aberration, field curvature, spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism. So in order to correct for this, the one variable that we really must know is the optical path length. Okay. So when designing a complex lens, knowing the optical path length under a specific set of conditions, we can go ahead and calculate how to solve for all these aberrations. The optical path length defined right here is simply the physical length of every material in that optical system times its refractive index summed up through this entire lens, through the immersion media, through the cover glass, to the point in the specimen that you're imaging. Okay. So it's nice and simple when we're inside the lens because we know to an extremely high accuracy the thickness of each optical element. We also know its refractive in indice index all the way out to several decimal places. However, immersion media is really a variable. If you get a bottle of immersion oil, it'll have a refractive index of 1.515, but when you look closely, you'll see that that refractive index is only for a single wavelength of light, and it's only at 23 degrees if that's a, a standard immersion oil. So immersion media actually decreases its refractive index as it warms up. So it's actually a variable. Cover glass is a variable as well. Um, cover glass that we typically use is 170 microns thick. But if you go and actually measure the glass in a uh, box of cover slips, you'll see that there's a plus or minus 10% range uh, 
of the thickness of that cover glass. Um, the biggest variable is really the specimen. There's not a lot you can do to uh, control for that. The specimen may have very, very um, optically dense areas with refractive indices approaching 1.4, such as pure protein, or refractive indices down uh, close to that of water at around 1.33, average probably about 1.38. So in the ch case of live cell imaging, you have many different refractive indices and they're moving all the time. Okay. Okay. So when we actually design an objective lens, we have to make um, certain assumptions to be able to solve that math. So the parameters that they use to design a lens are that you're only going to use one wavelength of green light, you're only going to work at 23 degrees. The cover glass is exactly 170 microns thick, and you will image only point sources at the surface of that cover slip and never focus into the specimen. And if we can make those assumptions, we can calculate um, the formula to design these, these complicated lenses. However, in reality, most people cannot work at those conditions. So we have to understand the aberration to minimize it as much as possible. So how serious a problem th is this? Well. If you look, there's that perfect little point spread function on the, on the uh, top left there, and that's right at the surface of the cover slip. When we go just two microns into the cell, the middle panel there on the top, you now look like a small bulbous rocket ship. Ten microns in on the, the bottom far left, it looks like a long stretched rocket ship. So imagine you're imaging and every point in your specimen looks like this spread out rocket ship with these streaking tails coming down from it. Um, basically that's going to decrease the signal where your specimen actually is and give you a diffuse background. That's why spherical aberration, many people hear the word spherical, they think it's a curvature, but in reality spherical aberration when you look in the microscope looks like a softness or a haziness in the image. And it's one of those things where if you're looking in the microscope and you keep going through focus and you're trying to focus on the specimen but it never really become sharp or crisp, that's generally spherical aberration. There's nothing wrong with the microscope. You just uh, have a, an issue that you need to deal with. Okay. Okay. So how do we correct for spherical aberration? Um, we're going to have a, another uh, tip that will go into some more detail on that. But in general, you try to work closely to those design uh, criteria or you use objectives that have correction collars in them. Well, how does a correction collar work? So generally what we'll do is we will look uh, in the lens ray trace and look for the area in the lens, which you can see is all the way up front here, where you have the steepest angle between two lens groups. So we would take all of these lenses back here and put them in a brass tube. We would score a groove around that tube, put a pin in it and correct it connect a collar to that, then we would fix the other lenses in the front of that angle in another breast tube, and when we turn that collar, it moves all of these lenses back and forth, and then this angle up here, the steep angle, is then going to go like this as those lenses move back and forth. So what happens is the axial rays that are focusing uh, further away are now brought into focus with the peripheral rays because we're moving those peripheral rays much more significantly than we're moving those axial rays. And that's basically how a correction collar works. Okay, So here's just a few images that show you spherical aberration. Here's a uh, three color image, a uh, fluorescent um, labeled cell, and you can see uh, actin uh, labeled in green, and you can see uh, mitochondria in red, and the DNA in the nucleus labeled in blue. And you can resolve all of these structures, and you can even see some structure in the nucleus, but it looks hazy, it looks soft. If we go ahead and correct for spherical aberration, now you see the contrast just jumps out, and it really can make a big difference um, in your imaging. It can actually make the difference between seeing what you're interested in or not. Um, here's another specimen, and this is one that uh, we've worked with uh, in the lab for a resolution test specimen. This is a, a diatom, and the surface spicules here on this diatom are, are a good test specimen because they're right at the limit of resolution of the optical microscope. And you can see that in this image with spherical aberration, it looks kind of soft or hazy, but you go ahead and switch to uh, correct for spherical aberration, and you can then really get a jump in contrast. Okay. So that's all I have on uh, optics and aberrations. Uh, thank you very much.